Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're so glad you can join us today. I'm Kate McNamara of Georgetown University. Um, and this is a series that my colleague Abraham Newman and I are running this year at the Mortara Center for International Studies at Georgetown. It's part of a larger project called the Global Political Economy Project that Abe and I have been fortunate to get funding from the Open Society Foundation and also from our Board of Regents at Georgetown to undertake. And our project is really trying to think about ways of reimagining what global markets are, how they work, how politics and power matter for them, and how issues like the transformations of the digital economy, issues around identity and race, issues around the environment matter for how we study and think about the global economy. And so I should say straight off that one of our hopes in this project is to make more visible some of these underlying dynamics that traditional scholars have not necessarily looked at. And so I should mention that Mortara acknowledges that Georgetown's university's success today is in part the product of a history of enslaved labor at Georgetown and the selling of human beings in order to keep us solvent. Um, if you'd like to learn more about that uh, part of Georgetown's past, something that we're working very hard to think about how to uh, absolve and go forward and educate people about, um, there's a link in the chat, which will take you to some information about that. But today's speaker series is part of a uh, very interesting year-long uh, series that we have around the digital economy and security. Um, it's part of a larger collaboration we have running on campus. And we're really thrilled that today we have two speakers who have really pioneered the study of how we might think about technology and politics and how cyber matters in the world. Um, we're gonna have their full bios put into the chat, but we have Anita Godes, who's a professor of international and cybersecurity at the Hertie School in Berlin. And we have Ronald Diebert, who's professor of political science and director of the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Um, we're gonna start off our conversation about um, transnational repression with them. Anita will speak for about 10 or so minutes, and then we'll turn to Ron, who will also speak for about 10 minutes. I'll then do some follow-up questions based on uh, what they've um, given us, their interventions, and then we'll move to our question and answer. Um, and the way we're gonna run that is actually through the chat function. So please do submit your qu questions uh, directly into the chat, um, and you can send them to everyone, you can send them to me as you like, um, and we'll get do our best to get to as many questions as we can uh, during the seminar. So let me just say welcome again, and we'll turn it over to Anita. Thank you so much, Kate, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak on this um, during this event. Uh, I feel very honored to be on the panel with both you and Ron. Um, and I'm delighted to kick this off because I know that Ron has a ton of fantastic um, cases to talk about. So I thought what I would do is um, maybe talk a bit more broadly about this idea of digital repression or repression in the digital age. And that includes, of course, transnational repression. So maybe just as a brief upfront, what do we mean when we talk about repression? It's important in this context, right? Generally, when we talk about repression, we talk about physical sanctions by state actors aimed at deterring individual or collective mobilization against the prevailing social or political order. And usually that is done in an instrumental way to raise either the physical or material costs. Now, in the traditional sense of understanding repression, it was very much repression against individuals based within the territory of a state. And of course, in the context of you know, the expansion of the internet, um, we are thinking much more about digitally enabled transnational repression. So targeting people outside of your own territory. Um, and states use a lot of different types of repression. So preventive repression, reactive repression, indiscriminate repression, targeted repression against specific individuals or groups. Um, but one kind of underlying takeaway, and that's useful for us to think about as we think about the role of online um, tools in repression is that effective repression generally requires information for states. And because that information ideally allows them to target either those individuals or groups that pose a threat while sparing others. It's kind of one of the underlying ideas that we have about how repression works. 
So if we start from that, then we can think about how digital tools can actually be incorporated into states repressive apparatuses. And ultimately, a lot of these online tools are about information. They're about gathering information, they're about controlling information, and they're about producing information. Or put differently, they're about surveillance, censorship, and propaganda. Now, for those of you who've you know, worked in this field, you, you might say none of this is new. States have always engaged in surveillance, in censorship, and propaganda. And so what I'd like to do in the couple of minutes I have left is kind of tease out some of the, the actual new things about um, rep repression online. Um, and specifically, we see that these on online tools have changed the reach, and that includes reaching beyond state borders, the speed and the scale of information operations. Um, so I'm briefly going to give some examples from both surveillance and censorship. So if we think about traditional forms of surveillance in repressive states, usually we had kind of involuntary or voluntary informant networks that were maintained by or are maintained by security services, um, and they might be operating both at home and, at, uh, and abroad. Um, now, these are incredibly resource, resource intensive and they take a long time time to build. So if you look at authoritarian states, building a security apparatus just takes a very, very long time, especially if you want it to work, um, you know, effectively. Uh, and so introducing online tools has really made it easier for states to access hard to reach populations. Um, because the network they're relying on in this case isn't kind of the slow built human, um, human factor, it's relying on the internet which relies in turn on mass adoption. Um, and so it's making it much easier for states to monitor someone's phone, for example, across the world. And I know that Ron is going to give us some, um, some really great um, examples on, on this, but this has really changed the, the access and the infrastructure used for surveillance by states. So it's not only expanded the reach, it's also ex expanded the type and the scale of information available. So if you think about search histories, if you think about call histories, location profiles, um, and I'm based in Berlin. I always like to give the example of the former GDR, which of course had one of the most uh, you know, well-known secret services. Um, and if you read these biographies by people who were part of the Stasi, they would tell you, you know, um, it's actually, you know, we were, we were um, constrained in how many people we could actually wiretap. You know, we had like a limit per person that we could wiretap. Now those limits have kind of gone away now. And so that's really changed just the scale and the amount of information that's available. And so one direct kind of result of this um, in both my work and then also in the work by people such as Suksu is that this rise in online surveillance has really correlates with an increase in targeted forms of violent repression. And this is something that, you know, um, we're, we're starting to find, you know, case evidence for, but we don't really have cross-national um, evidence for this yet. And then I briefly also want to talk about censorship. <clears throat> and here again, it's, you know, it's, it's useful for us to compare traditional forms of media censorship. So you might shut down a newspaper, you might regulate it, you might restaff it with your own loyal people, introduce new laws and so on and so forth. And again, these are very um, resource intensive, slow to implement and slow to reverse strategies. We compare that with shutting down the internet, shutting down parts of the internet, using off the shelf filtering technology, then the speed again has, has changed and the reach has changed as well. So if we think about um, not only shutting down access within your own country, but using distributed denials of service attacks against um, you know, websites by people who are based abroad or hacking members of the diaspora, then these are all ways in which um, censorship has really changed um, in the online sphere. So why does this matter? Well, if we look around the world, internet shutdowns are increasing. Um, they're stifling collective mobilization. They're hiding repression. <laughs> Um, they're prohibiting information exchange, um, both within countries, but also abroad. And importantly, they are oftentimes prohibiting the exchange of information between diaspora groups and groups um, based within the country. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about, you know, some examples of this. One example would be um, the internet shutdown in November 2019 in Iran that really was an example of an increase in indiscriminate repression and a severing of communication channels between Iranian diaspora and members of the, of the protest movement um, on the ground. So maybe two key takeaways. Um, I think we are witnessing the fallouts of internet shutdowns to a certain degree. Um, a very recent one, of course, now is in Sudan, um, but we're only witnessing it to a certain degree because in a sense, these information vacuums are working and that should be something that concerns us a lot. 
Um, we're also getting, luckily, including because of the work by Ron and by members, for example, of the Amnesty Tech um, team, we're getting more information about intrusive surveillance technology, but we're still not fully comprehending the impact it has on traditional forms of oppression. And the final point I want to make is that I think within the literature on international relations, the, um, the, the, the research looking at interstate cyber warfare um, is at the moment still very much kind of disjointed from the work that we have on transnational repression and non-domestic repression, to be, to be completely frank. But if we think about some of the core strategies of cyber warfare, so subversion, espionage, and sabotage, those pretty much translate into surveillance, censorship, and propaganda. And so I think um, one thing that we could really get you know, better at is combining these different literatures and learning from each other and kind of moving forward um, in that area. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Fantastic. That you, you, what a teaser. You give us so many interesting things to, to talk about. So we'll move on to Ron for now. Okay, great. Thank you, Kate, and, and thank you for those uh, framing comments. I mean, very, very helpful. A um, few words about uh, first the Citizen Lab, and, and then I'll talk about uh, my remarks. So um, for those of you who don't know, the Citizen Lab does research on digital security issues uh, that arise out of uh, human rights uh, concerns. I'm the founder and still the current director. We've been around for 20 years this year, actually. Um, we use a mixed methods approach, so we combine um, skills and techniques and methods for many different disciplines. We especially leverage computer science and engineering science. We do a lot of forensic research um, on uh, risks to civil society in the digital space. And I guess uh, we see ourselves as kind of providing a, a counterintelligence capacity for global civil society. And I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. Um, actually, I'm not gonna go into a bunch of specific examples so much. Um, but rather talk about what I see as two major trends that have been converging over the last decade that are in a kind of symbiotic relationship that I, I think bear on the topic of our discussion today. One is the growing market for commercial surveillance and private intelligence services. And this market is largely unregulated, very profitable, but growing very quickly and causing an epidemic of harms worldwide. The second trend is the evolution of the digital communications ecosystem that we live in and that we rely on, which is invasive by design, but poorly regulated and deeply insecure up and down the entire infrastructure, which creates growing target exposure for victims and also opportunities for uh, seemingly endless exploitation um, by bad actors. So let me first talk about the market for commercial surveillance and private intelligence. What this has done is really fundamentally altered the resource landscape for the exercise of authoritarian power. So as recently as a few decades ago, if you look at you know, a typical authoritarian regime, uh, they lacked in-house math, science and technology capabilities that would enable them to undertake the, the type of foreign influence, espionage, subversion type of things that Anita just uh, spoke about, the things that have become very common today. But beginning in the 2000s, once the disruptive and politically mobilizing potential of digital technologies became apparent, especially in events like the Arab Spring, a lot of uh, regimes began to organize themselves to aggressively counter them. And what happened was a vast and diverse range of private firms, many of them associated with cybersecurity and counterterrorism, sprouted to serve this uh, growing appetite. Most of these firms have their origins in the West and really have their roots in uh, the developments that took place after 9-11 and the ensuing long war on terror. Um, regulation around this industry is very weak and so, or even absent, you might say. And so these firms have been able to originate in the West, but then expand very quickly their sales and services to authoritarian and a liberal regimes with little resistance, indeed often with the assistance of their home governments through bilateral or regional security assistance agreements. Um, and so you, we've seen the services of these type of firms being used to facilitate despotism, kleptocracy, authoritarianism, and of course, transnational repression. Um, so thanks to this marketplace, thanks to these firms, uh, 
regimes that lack these in-house capabilities can kind of go and purchase them off the shelf, creating what I call a new type of despotism as a service. Let me give you just one example from our research. So take the case of Ethiopia, one of the poorest countries of the, in the world with something like less than 25% uh, internet penetration can, thanks to a company like Cyberbit, uh, which is an Israeli-based company, uh, mount a global cyber espionage campaign targeting individuals in more than 20 countries worldwide. So that's really phenomenal in terms, of unprecedented in, in human history. What are the type of services they provide here? Well, everything from traffic analysis to data fusion and anal analytics, location tracking, intrusion software, basically hacking services, device forensics, biometric facial recognition, on and on and on. Um, there are also firms that specialize in reputation management, social media scraping, and more offensive activities in this space, what we used to think of as propaganda, psychologically based influence operations, which are also known as dark PR or digital black ops. This is a, a, a large and growing industry. A lot of these firms are offering dual use technologies, meaning they, they can be marketed with benign sounding purposes or have benign sounding markets, but then they can be redeployed to service uh, government security agencies. Good example is location data. So many firms uh, vacuum up location data from widely used apps and then repurpose them and sell that data to government, law enforcement, military and intelligence agencies worldwide. Another example would be facial recognition and the notorious company Clearview AI, which also demonstrates something that we see a lot of in this space, which is that you have a single firm, uh, one like Clearview AI, servicing dozens of repressive regime clients at once, which really multiplies uh, the webs of, of possible malfeasance. So that's that one trend. Uh, the trend on the other side has to do with digital technologies. And here, I think you can sum it up by saying something about targets and their exposure. Uh, which has gone from weak or thin is the way I describe it to strong and, and saturated. And this has to do mostly with the business model of social media, which has been referred to as surveillance capitalism, which boils down to pushing digital sensors closer and closer to users in order to e extract and monetize fine grained and highly revealing personal data from them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, while it's highly convenient to be plugged in at all times, users can easily overlook the fact that their network devices are also windows into their own private lives for those on the outside looking in. Um, another feature of the digital ecosystem is that it's highly invasive, but as I said before, fundamentally insecure. Um, insecurity all up and down the infrastructure of the digital ecosystem from the very network layers, the cell phone system itself I can talk about, all the way up to our devices and the applications that are embedded in them, which creates these endless opportunities for exploitation, especially if you have these well-trained engineers working for these surveillance firms doing nothing all day but scouring all of these applications, looking for something to exploit. Um, the latest iterations of those exploits are now to the point where they require no interaction on the part of the, the target and uh, leave no visible trace on the device of any type of malfeasance or abnormality. Um, in other words, with say NSO's Pegasus, a government client can simply hypothetically take over any device in the world that they want without the user knowing and monitor everything on that device. And then of course you have the social media ecosystem, which is attention driven emotionally exploitative by design, which is perfect for sowing confusion, doubt, and cynicism, as we all know. Um, but of course, there's a whole industry around this now. Um, so what we are seeing, and this has been borne out in the research by the Citizen Lab and other groups around the world, is an epidemic of harms. Um, so we're seeing um, the abuse of this type of surveillance technology to go after journalists, human rights activists, lawyers, uh, political opposition figures, and, and others, even academics such as ourselves. And it's really having an important chilling effect. 
Um, we're seeing this firsthand in the interviews that we're doing with victims of this type of surveillance who fear blackmail, false incrimination, uh, leading to reputational damages or criminal charges. Um, there is a kind of widespread fear and psychological trauma that is impacting uh, these people. People are afraid to communicate with each other, use the internet even, or trust their computers and mobile devices. And, and this is really interesting, I think, historically, because it really flips on, on its head the conventional wisdom that many people had 20 years ago about the internet and global civil society. What we're seeing is really the opposite effect. It's, it's a huge um, area of exposure and insecurity. And also, uh, people are beginning to be afraid to use it. Um, now, when it comes to accountability and transparency in this space, secrecy is a major feature of the commercial surveillance and private intelligence marketplace. It's inherent to it. Uh, companies set up all sorts of shell companies, intermediary companies that makes any type of due diligence or even research difficult to pin down who's selling what to whom. You combine that with secrecy laws and non-disclosure agreements between vendors and government clients. And then you add in the fact that most of the government clients are security agencies, the least publicly accountable typically in any government or any regime, but especially so in illiberal or authoritarian environments. So let me conclude quickly by just saying that as a consequence of the spread of this type of commercial surveillance and private intelligence and the inherent insecurity and invasiveness of digital ecosystem, uh, we are seeing a um, dramatic fueling of the spread of authoritarian practices, kleptocracy and corruption, which overall, in addition to some of the harms that we highlight at the Citizen Lab, I believe is presenting a very serious and growing risk to liberal democratic institutions worldwide. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Leaving us on such a cheerful note, Ron. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Both such interesting presentations, really provocative, really laying out um, these important issues. So let me start off. I know there are going to be a lot of questions for you. And you know, we have a lot of folks in the audience who are working in this space and will have a lot to contribute. But um, I guess a couple of things that I that I that I'd love for us to maybe take a couple moments on. One is I think both speakers sort of laid out the ways in which the digital world has created these new dangers. Uh, Ron talks about an epidemic of harms, and Anita talked about all the different ways in which um, the reach, speed, and scale of government repression has been accelerated with. Um, the digital capacities, right, given 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 to governments. Um, and I would love to hear a little bit more about what you see as sort of the variation or under what conditions do we actually see these sort of worth out, worse outcomes. Interestingly, you know, you both talked about authoritarian regimes, but then we also heard about sort of, you know, liberal, you know, liberal democracy. We heard about sort of more, you know, the role of markets and um, surveillance capitalism, which I think is incredibly important. And that's, you know, a, a very under-researched area. You know, it seems to me a lot of folks have sort of siloed to look at the security side and, and then the economic side and market side. And we need to think about how those things relate. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about, you know, what you see as sort of variation in these phenomena across different countries, across different types of regimes, et cetera, which sort of leads then to the next big thing that I want to make sure we talk about, which is sort of, well, what do we do, right? What, what kind of policy solutions might be out there that we can um, think through? And you know, do you see any sort of tender green shoots of places where people might come together either internationally or, or domestically to deal with this? So first let's, let's you know, tease out a little bit more of maybe the, the nuances and the variation. So Anita, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. So I think, um, I think um, the way in which I often frame this is talking about authoritarian leaders, repressive leaders. I think we're becoming better at, as repression scholars, moving away from this idea that authoritarian countries are the only countries that use repression. I think that's a relatively new development, but I think it's a very important one. Um, and I think the way that we can frame a lot of these tools 
And as Ron said, a lot of these tools are provided by commercial firms, um, is that they are authoritarian tools but they're used by all types of regimes. Um, and so I am thinking specifically now about the release of the big, you know, the, the big release around the Pegasus um, software earlier this year, where a team of, um, I think about 70 journalists worked together to uncover all the different countries in which this, this uh, surveillance software was being used. Um, and, you know, many of those countries weren't authoritarian countries. Um, there were, uh, you know, um, suspicions that they were, for example, being used within the European Union, within Hungary and so on. And so I think that gives us an idea of, and that gets back to the point that Ron was making about this being technology developed in the context of counterterrorism um, and counterinsurgency. And when we, when we kind of put that together, we see why these tools are not only being used in authoritarian countries, because the, the use case is not only about repressing domestic opposition, but more broadly about policing, counterterrorism, and so on and so forth. And so I think that's that's one important point. The other point I'll say is I've collected some um, more global data looking at internet shutdowns um, using data by, um, there's, a, there's a fantastic project, the Internet Outage Data Project, I think it's called, um, at the University of San Diego. Um, and they collect all this data on um, minute instances, microscopic instances of shutdown. So when we look at that by regime type, it's not the most autocratic countries actually doing most of the, the you know, shutting down. It's more the countries in the middle. And this kind of gets again at this question of which countries still have opposition groups that they need to repress, right? And which countries still have an interest in controlling the narrative in the context, for example, of protests. And it tends to be illiberal or you know non-liberal democracies and then these kind of electoral autocracies so so that tells us a little bit about where this contestation is there and i'll say and maybe that on, on the bright side i don't think states would be so interested in regulating access to the internet if they weren't genuinely afraid of, of civil society groups you know making use of it for their own advantage and so i think that that's why we see that correlation as well fantastic and you know that speaks to sort of ron's point about when the internet got underway, we all had this very positive, you know, cheerful idea that in fact these, these groups would take advantage of it. One follow-up question. So you talked about how the kind of infrastructure constraints that might um, have plagued earlier governments that were in their sort of territorial, you know, rooted in territory with the wiretapping, for example. Um, one set of arguments that actually my colleague Abe Newman, who wishes he could be here today and he sadly can't, one set of arguments that he's, of course, made with his weaponized interdependence work with Harry Fer Henry Farrell is that actually state power still matters, that big, powerful states are the ones who can you know, squeeze in and, and use, use the digital landscape to their own ends. But sort of what I'm hearing, you know, Ron's example about Ethiopia and the contracting out is that actually some of that is washing away, that actually the kind of lifting of um, the kind of territorial constraints actually has opened up the box to a much broader set of actors. Is that sort of what I'm hearing you say, Anita? Yeah? Okay, great. All right, we'll leave it at that. Ron, okay. can you kind of uh, talk a little bit about this question about thinking through the variation or is, mm -hmm. is there no variation in fact? Are all states sort of uh, open, open to these various phenomena? Yeah, I think the point you just made is one I definitely agree with. I, I think, you know, and we're generalizing here, but if you look, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, how difficult it would be um, to undertake an operation like that, which we uncovered around the close confidence of the murdered Washington Post journalist, Jamal Khashoggi. So one of the most important was a Canadian permanent resident, Omar Abdulaziz. Um, we discovered that his phone was hacked with Pegasus and we published our report the day before Khashoggi disappeared in the embassy. What we didn't know is they were for many months communicating over what they thought were end-to-end -end encrypted messaging apps. But the whole time, one party on that uh, line, namely Omar, had his phone hacked and Saudi operatives were listening in. Um, interestingly, Saudi Arabia did send uh, security agents to Canada to try to intimidate him, persuade him to go back to Saudi Arabia to visit the uh, Saudi uh, embassy in Ottawa, in fact, which is chilling to think of. He, he didn't do that on the advice of Khashoggi, interestingly. Um, but the reality is, you know, when you think about it, how this technology enables that type of transnational surveillance, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's when we talk about speed and lowering of cost and all that, 
it's important to really truly understand what we're talking about here. So, you know, in the past for Saudi Arabia to do something like that, to put under surveillance, um, just this one person's inner circle, it would require a lot of uh, labor power, traveling across borders, risky missions, violating local laws and foreign jurisdictions. Now you have this off the shelf capacity provided by uh, a, a company like NSO Group, which by the way, is made up of veterans of one of the world's most sophisticated signals intelligence agencies, right? So this is a commercialization of one state SIGINT capacity. Um, at the push of a button, you can not only reach across borders, but you can do a lot more than you could in the past because once you get inside someone's device and we carry these around with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can find out a lot about what a person is doing. You can follow them around. You can listen to their phone calls. You can do things that before were really quite technically difficult, not impossible, but really quite uh, elaborate uh, plans would have to be um, mounted to do this. Um, now you can slip inside their pockets and, and look over their shoulders 24 hours a day. One thing that's often overlooked is not just a wiretap capacity. There is uh, the possibility of planting falsely incriminating data on a phone. And of course, we see many examples of um, blackmail, um, uh, you know, private data that's taken, whether they're personal images and used to embarrass people, to undermine their reputation, especially I would say, if we're talking about variation, disproportionately targeting women. And, and this is, um, you know, something I think that, that should be highlighted in this conversation. Um, you know, I would say, however, all of that notwithstanding, uh, there is some important variation here. Um, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact, I, I also believe that authoritarian practice, you can't neatly divide the world into good countries and bad countries, democratic, authoritarian. There are authoritarian practices all, all over the world. But um, I would say the difference is that there are, relatively speaking, stronger restraints against the abuse of power in some countries as opposed to others. So if you look at Saudi Arabia, there's really nothing to stop that type of personal uh, abuse of power at the helm of the government. The security services have no one watching over them and they can do any type of harm that they want without any, if you look at a country like the United States, yes, sure, Snowden disclosure showed us a lot of overreach and things that were being done um, that uh, were illegal, even uh, harmful, whatever you wanna say, but at least we have oversight mechanisms in Congress and other areas that can check to some degree what those governments are doing. So I don't, I really don't think we should lose sight of the fact that there is a spectrum of restraints here and the liberal regimes on the one side um, are, are really, um, you know, not being watched carefully. So there's an interesting kind of question that I think fits neatly in this from Lisa Garb, uh, who asked, would you consider some diaspora activists more vulnerable to transnational surveillance than others, e.g. depending on where they are based, say the EU versus the US or elsewhere in the world, which gets a little bit at that nuance of sort of, you know, how, how should we be thinking about these things? Or is the answer no? Who would like to, to jump in? Ron is smiling, go ahead. Sure. Well, I, I mean, it's interesting. This may be a bit of a, a one-off answer, I suppose, but I'll just give you one example. So NSO Group reportedly has some kind of uh, a restriction on the area codes of numbers that can be targeted. And then that's why we don't see very often targeting of Canadian and U.S. numbers, although we've seen documented us, I'm talking about, uh, victims who are, are U.S. citizens and Canadian permanent residents who've had their phones hacked using Pegasus. So just with respect to that one company, uh, and, and I can tell you they, they have had, you know, uh, upwards of 30 government clients worldwide. If you happen to be worried about that one company, maybe you'd be safer in a country with an area code where you think that they might not be targeted. But then again, this is just an internal kind of decision by the company, it's not some kind of hardwired constraint on uh, who or what can be targeted. Um, I think generally speaking, though, um, and Anita probably has a lot to say about this as well, if you look at those who study transnational repression in general, um, what we are hearing uh, from interviews that are done with refugees and immigrants, people who fled abroad, is that um, they lack support from their governments. They are 
in fact, very fearful of reporting to authorities because you have, you know, security services in those countries and the countries that they, they are seeking refuge who are not really trustworthy themselves and often see those people as intelligence assets as opposed to human beings that should be protected. And I think generally speaking, this is something that liberal democratic countries need to invest in um, to understand that this is a huge risk and we haven't put enough resources into protecting people who are now targeted in this manner. Great, Anita, do you have some other comments? Yeah, just uh, two comments on that. So first of all, um, following up on what, what Ron said, I think um, it's important to distinguish who the, the, the state is that is uh, you know, from, from, from where the repression is emanating. So I think we're seeing within the European Union, I, I, before I moved to Berlin, I was in Zurich, a lot of discussion about um, specifically um, citizens from China being directly targeted within Switzerland. So I think it really depends on who the country is who's doing the transnational repression. Um, and a lot of that has to do with what Ron was saying in terms of getting support from the kind of host state that they, that they were living in. And, and it really depends on the geopolitics there, uh, the extent to which um, you're likely to be exposed to the diaspora, the diaspora is like to be, uh, likely to be exposed. Um, but I wanna, I wanna hear again, kind of draw the comparison to, to, to interstate cyber warfare. And I actually wanna draw on something that Jackie Schneider said in your first uh, session, I, I watched it, it was very interesting. And she was talking about doing these war games with, uh, with you know, uh, people working within the policy world and seeing what their reactions to cyber attacks were. And one of the things that she finds is that compared to kinetic attacks, policymakers or you know, members of the security establishment are less likely to want to react and retribute when they are exposed to cyber attacks than other types of attacks, right? And that's exactly the problem we have here. If it were a member of the diaspora actually being attacked, you know, being, you know, maybe shot or stabbed, um, that person would likely receive more support than essentially with you know experiencing a cyber attack abroad um, and I think that gets to your point of what, what we can do we need to take these instances much more seriously we have to see them as an act of, of transnational repression and not just some kind of you know low level information operation. Right and maybe we can kind of segue a little bit to this question of sort of you know what should we do Erica Chenoweth uh, sent me a message um, sort of saying, well, for those of us concerned with digital repression, what should we be advocating for? And then she sort of lays out beautifully all the different kind of issues involved with thinking about, you know, going for more regulation domestically, that that could actually, you know, strengthen the hand of authoritarian regimes, self-regulation of businesses and civil society groups seems untenable, um, global treaties, sort of international cooperative um, kind of agreements seem very hard to figure out how to design and monitor and so on. And she also mentions, you know, one of the unique things about, about all of this is how much we as users voluntarily participate, right, in setting up the conditions that make it possible for the various things you guys have outlined to occur. So uh, what, you know, where do we start kind of thinking about uh, how to go forward? would like to start. Ron. Uh, I, I can go. Uh, I mean, that's obviously a huge topic for discussion. And if you got a message from Erica with a long list, I, I'm sure we could go on for hours as well from my end because we've been thinking a lot about it. So what I would say, it's helpful to kind of narrow down what is it that we're talking about. And I would say, okay, to me, the most acute problem right now is, is mercenary spyware mm -hmm. because it's so invasive and so dangerous, so lethal, in fact when you can get inside somebody's device, the type of capabilities, you know, uh, Israel's signals intelligence agency commercialized. Who would have thought, you know, what, what does that mean when you have dozens of governments with that type of capability as a service, right? Despotism as a service. So what are we going to do about it? It's, it's not an easy problem. And I've been circulating in this space for quite a while. Some people are calling for a global moratorium on the sale and transfer of this type of technology, which I understand the motivation for, um, and it certainly highlights the severity of the problem. I frankly, I don't think it's realistic. And I think that um, it, it may be, um, you know, not a wise thing to advocate for something that is not realistic. So where do we go? If that's not gonna happen, I, I won't get into why I think it's yeah. not realistic. Well, we saw the US uh, 
uh, Commerce Department uh, sanctioned NSO Group and another company that's citizen lab research called Kendiru, as well as three other companies, put them on a blacklist. Um, that was profoundly important, very welcome development, because what it means is that those companies cannot do business uh, with US entities and vice versa. And um, this, uh, you know, these are lucrative companies. NSO was about to go public and was valued at something like 2 billion. Now it's a hot potato. No one's gonna touch it because of that ruling. So what you're doing is you're getting at its financial support system. If other governments synced up, and I, I wish my own government uh, would do so, um, it would be even more powerful a, a deterrent. That's not gonna stop though what is coming down the pipeline. Uh, we've seen a lot of Western companies so far, but that's changing. Very, we're already seeing uh, Chinese companies, Russian companies, most of them operate in the kind of cyber criminal underworld. Indian companies, there's a company that we highlighted called Beltrox, like a four person company based in Delhi, India that uh, sold cyber espionage services to dozens of clients, hacking everything from civil society to other businesses. You know, how do you deal with that problem? Uh, very, very difficult. I agree getting at, at some of the roots, the low hanging fruit is very important. Uh, a lot of the exploitation that we're seeing is because of the insecurity of the ecosystem that we rely on to communicate. So if we can fix that, that's, that's also, you know, another five hour conversation. How do we slow down surveillance capitalism and secure digital technologies? Not an easy problem to fix. Um, but, but, you know, that kind of points to where the conversation I think would have to go. Domestic laws around the industry, mm -hmm. maybe passing legislation that enables victims to sue both foreign governments. So, you know, dealing with the sovereign immunity protections, um, but also enabling them to sue the enablers the private firms in domestic jurisdictions. Like if Omar Abdulaziz in Canada could sue Saudi Arabia and sue NSO group in Canadian courts, financial penalties might dissuade at least the companies from providing that kind of reckless service. And so what I'm really hearing is that, you know, because um, the market is so important in the development and spread of these technologies, turn that around and use the market to sanction and incentivize and disincentivize different types of behaviors. And that that could be sort of as powerful a way as thinking just in terms of sort of straightforward regulation. So be creative about it and think, think about ways to do that. And I, you know, this notion of sort of, you know, US intelligence services, you know, blacklisting NSO and so on and so forth, you know, that 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 could potentially also be be effective. Anita, what what's your stab at at Erica's um, Erica's challenge to us? Yeah, no, that, that that's a great question, and I wish I had um, I had better better answers. But to to maybe add to what Ron was saying, I think two two things are really important, and um, maybe that's me being too academic now. You know, countering it with more problems, but hopefully it you know contributes a little bit to 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 this discussion. The first I think is fully getting public buy-in on the actual extent to which this is a problem. Because I think we talk about this all the time, people who work with civil society are aware of this problem. But I think to a certain extent, if we think about the reactions to the revelations by Edward Snowden, now almost 10 years ago, I mean, there was a global outcry, but then there was also a sense of like, to what extent is this actually relevant for me every day? And so I think there needs to be a clearer sense of this is part of repression. And if you are, you know, living within a society that values living repression free, then you have to understand this, that this is kind of a part of it. And I think that has to do with directly drawing a link between the hacking of your of your technology and the physical harms that come from it because because to a certain extent we're still kind of seeing those divorced from each other so i think it is a public opinion um, issue and that you know more broadly when we think about critical infrastructure and and, and cyber security is is a question getting public buy-in the second point is this mismatch and Maybe let's just bracket out the, the, the companies that Ron was saying, you know, in India and, 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 and Russia and China. But to, to a certain extent, we have a mismatch here between companies that are based in the global north and a lot of the people who are um, feeling the really terrible repercussions based in the global south or based in countries that aren't, you know, within the jurisdiction of these companies. And I'm not just talking about the, you know, uh, cyber mercenaries. I'm also talking about big tech companies. And so I think um, 
with within the discussion now around regulation of, of social media, we are, you know, th there seems to finally be a little bit of movement also due to, you know, numerous whistleblowers coming from within Facebook, um, but they offer perspective again coming from the US or coming from Europe. And so I think if we want to actually get a hold on this problem and understand all of the kind of repercussions that they have, we need to listen to the people who are most affected by this. And they generally are not based in the US or in Europe. And um, so I think that could be one way to actually listen to civil society groups based in the Philippines. Um, thankfully, Maria Ressa got the Nobel Peace Prize this year. And um, I think that's, you know, one of the ways to, I mean, she's been subjected to some of the worst um, you know, state-sponsored online harassment, um, and and I think I think just you know including those those voices in the discussion around regulation will be you know help us avoid mistakes that we were only aware of ten years down the line. Yeah, I mean it's really fascinating because you two have sort of sketched out um, you know very very powerfully all of the different ways in which the development of these technologies interacting both with markets and with um, political regimes and political elites and political motivated political actors has really changed this landscape in, in such a profound way. But I think our, you know, as academics, our models of sort of what globalization is, what the global economy is, what the global security landscape is, has not kept up, right? I mean, I really think that there's, you know, I don't know if it's sort of, you know, ignorance that just is is because people sort of aren't paying attention or, you know, I wonder if it's sort of like, you know, some of the problems around public buy-in and awareness of climate change, it's so overwhelming, right? It seems so big and difficult, you know, to try to sort of, you know, wrestle it to the ground and figure out how to go forward. But what I'm hearing is sort of, you know, things like the the discussion around social media and Facebook and the whistleblower coming forward that you know it's better to kind of take small bites at it and sort of figure out you know specific ways highlighting specific individuals from the global south that that have you know endured these horrendous uh, amounts of repression have the social media you know part and so on so I mean is that you know in a way you know, is that sort of one way forward is sort of imagining not one single blueprint answer, but rather thinking about all these different points at which we might imagine ways to motivate political actors and citizens to go forward. And um, you're nodding. So I guess that's good. And Ron, 20 years, right, with this lab, I mean, you've, you've, you've sort of watched this whole thing develop um, over time. So I mean, can you respond a little bit to that, to my comments? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think that in the early days, um, I, I and my team and my colleagues are mostly interested in um, challenging the assumption back then that ICTs were uh, enabling democracy and liberalization. We're saying, actually, I don't think that's true. So let's go look for evidence. And what we found was the kind of trend line I described that you, we saw this um, uh, you know, the unleashing of all of these capabilities, mostly through the private sector, kind of a, a, a rippling effect of, of counterterrorism and 9-11 surveillance, right? Um, I, I do agree. I, I think the way you characterize it is, is how I see um, the approach that, that we take in terms of policy engagement, which is to think about these things pragmatically. For example, um, one of the things that we have to do at the Citizen Lab, and maybe unique because of the nature of the work that we do, is collaborate with uh, security teams at large platforms, and and there's a you know if if we were stridently anti, put your com insert company name here, um, that would be counterproductive uh, because those the security teams in those companies have enormous visibility into the harms that we're talking about. They can see a lot of what's going on. They can take preventive measures. Um, so it wasn't that long ago when the idea of state-sponsored security warnings being sent out by Twitter and Google was unheard of. Now it's happening. That's one thing, right? Um, so you, you, you try to build up you know, um, uh, some kind of mitigation uh, through a variety of means and methods to claw back and protect civil society is the way that I think about it. Um, and you know, that means also getting law enforcement. There, there must be, geez, uh, there are probably at least uh, seven or eight uh, law enforcement investigations into NSO group as we speak right now, largely as a result of the harms that have been unearthed. 
by us, by Amnesty Security Lab. And that's important too, right? You wanna hold people accountable for the bad things they're doing. That's what the rule of law is about. And you know, if you can encourage that to happen in a, in a appropriate manner, then I think that's good as well. Anita, what, what political strategies do you think about going forward? Um, so I think maybe to add one that is less reactive, and I think that is really um, uh, a fantastic development that has really grown in, in kind of visibility over the last years, is this idea of um, not only reacting to um, you know, the unearthing of new types of technology, but to take more of a, uh, you know, preemptive stance on saying these are types of technology that we as a society do not want to have be, for example, part of our law enforcement systems, right? And so I think these, uh, for example, the Amnesty team is doing this big um, project on banning the scan, right? So banning, sort of, you know, biometric or, or, or facial recognition technology. And I think those, those are ways in which we're not saying i mean it's it's incredibly important um as as ron said for these companies to be blacklisted you know that's that's the way that we ultimately um get a get a bigger global impact but on a kind of more community-based level thinking about you know cities saying we as a city want to you know it, push through regulations that facial recognition technology is not going to be used unless you know there might be three or four exceptions for that, but otherwise, this is not something we want. Because otherwise, what you see is that police departments say, well, this would actually really help us. And we got this great um, advertisement on, on how this would improve our effectiveness. And then you get this kind of creeping digitalization of, for example, law enforcement and security. And so I think, I think specifically now, um, you know, thinking about maybe the context I live in, I think those are very, very effective ways to more broadly say, we don't want that technology and we're going to kind of legislate against it. Right, and certainly on the on the US side, it's been fascinating to sort of see folks on the left and the right be able to agree on the need to deal with big tech, right? That that is, you know, really um, hopeful and different, I would say, than, than what has gone on, you know, previously. So we just have a couple minutes left. Let me ask you, since most of our audience are, are folks, you know, PhD students, faculty, uh, folks in the academic world, um, you know, how should we be thinking about studying this going forward? And, you know, do you see actually new emerging work? Do you have students who are doing work, obviously your own work? You know, what would you say in terms of, you know, what are the areas that we need to, to keep pushing on to understand better? Uh, this this world that we live in. Anita, why don't you start us off? Yes, so I, I think um, we 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 are still we still don't have a full understanding to what extent digital tools are using, being used for protest management. And I'm specifically not saying protest repression, but kind of protest management, because I think the trend that we've kind of seen in the last decade is um, states, specifically authoritarian states, will allow a certain degree of protest but it will be heavily managed through disinformation campaigns, through active surveillance, through strategically shutting down the internet and so on and so forth. And so I think those interplays are things that we don't have um, you know, a, a good grasp on at this point. The second point, and I do actually have a PhD student working on this that I'm very excited about, is looking more into the strategic use of, um, of online harassment against individuals. So Ron said earlier, this is oftentimes something that women are exposed to more or other members of minority groups are, are exposed to. And uh, companies actually, a lot of social media companies have a lot of information on this, some of it public, most of it not public. Um, but we as academics still don't fully include that in our conceptualization of what repression is. It's, it's still kind of seen yeah. as something that's done by individuals and not necessarily state directed. And so I think broadening um, our, our viewpoint on who participates in state repression, right? It might be individuals who are doing this um, by targeting people as as Maria Ressa. And then the third point I think is being more system, thinking more systematically about the way in which surveillance is impacting mobilization. Because I think um, mm -hmm. only if we can really kind of show the, the direct link between mobilization or the capacity to mobilize and, and, and surveillance, will there be a, a bigger understanding of the, the detrimental effects? Absolutely. No, those are great points. Ron, would you like to finish up with sure. our research agenda? Yeah, I, I, I will take a step back and advocate for um, the, the need to kind of broaden our sense of, of, of how we approach the topic we've been speaking about as it relates to academic fields. I think, you know, 
it, I realize a lot of people say these sorts of things very often that, you know, the, the boundaries between disciplines don't make much sense. And I'm, I'm certainly one of those people. I, I, I have long since abandoned the idea of engaging as my primary professional motivation, the international relations field. It just seems to me like not much bang for the buck. And meanwhile, we've got uh, to recognize that the world has changed really quite fundamentally. We, we all now live in a di digital environment that surrounds us. And yet most of the important um, uh, features of that environment are hidden from public scrutiny. They, they're in black boxes, if you will. So I believe that we need to start thinking seriously about a new field of digital accountability that is interdisciplinary, that combines technical methods with legal methods, with policy engagement. Um, let's not forget that the divisions between the fields, the disciplines are themselves social constructs. They didn't exist uh, prior to maybe a hundred years ago or whatever. Most of them are even uh, more earlier creations. So the time has come for us to recognize that we have a new urgent pressing need to better understand the environment within which we communicate and how it's all structured from the, from the bottom up. Um, and that requires a different uh, interdisciplinary approach. Yeah, I think your uh, both of your comments are are so helpful. You know, both at the more sort of micro level, the things we should be studying, and then how we should be studying them. You know, the field of IR is really a creation of the American Academy in the post-war era, right? It's incredibly young discipline, and it was completely structured by the liberal international order with the United States at the center of it. And, you know, I teach international relations in the School of Foreign Service and so on and so forth. And, you know, we absolutely need to kind of blow up IR and figure out how to actually take into account not only the digital world we're living in, but, you know, post-colonial critiques and everything else, right? In order to actually equip our students with the kinds of understandings they need uh, going forward to solve all the problems, right? That we're gonna leave them with, so. All right, well, thank you both so very, very much. I know everyone um, participating on this call has, has learned a ton. We will have this recording up on our website um, for hopefully folks to be able to use for teaching and, and other, other things. But um, you know, best of luck with your incredibly important research that, that you're doing. And uh, once again, thank you so much for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having, having me, appreciate it. Thanks so much. That was really, really interesting. Good. For me. Good. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone.